Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke chapter 4 verses 21 to 30. Glory to you Lord Jesus Christ. Then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elisha when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. For the gospel of the Lord, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May the words that come from my mouth be inspired by your Holy Spirit. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this uh, Sunday's gospel overlaps and continues where we left off from last week's passage, which challenged us to bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, freedom for the oppressed, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And in that, we asked ourselves a hard question. Is this scripture fulfilled in our hearing today? Or does the comfort and security that we've gotten used to get in the way of our ability to hear and care for others? Is this scripture fulfilled in our hearing today? Or are we aware of those whose attention needs our care, have we been just distracted when the attention shifts away from us? Is this scripture fulfilled in our hearing today or are we afraid that there's not enough of God's blessings for everyone? So we need to make sure that we guard and protect those blessings that we currently have. I warned uh, those of you who heard my sermon last week that this encounter doesn't end well. We move from amazement to rage in six short verses. And here was I thinking that outrage and cancel culture was a new phenomenon. It seems kind of wrong to suggest this, but I will. I think it's Jesus' fault. He seems in this encounter to be the protagonist and the agitator. In the middle of all their pride and praise, he says some stuff that he knows is going to push their buttons. No doubt you'll probably quote the old saying, physician, heal thyself. You'll probably want me to do here what you've heard me doing in Capernaum, which is full of Gentiles. Well, guess what? No prophet is accepted in their hometown. And when the prophets of old came to do miracles and wonders, more often than not, it was for Israel's enemy. Think again. I sort of liken this to Jesus' Medvedev moment. If you're watching the interview after the quarterfinals, you would have heard uh, Medvedev raise the ire of the crowd when he told them 
that to get him back up and motivated for uh, getting back in the game, he asked himself, what would Novak do? And the crowd responded accordingly. Jesus knew his words would bring a strong reaction. So why would he say them? It takes a little bit of detective work to uncover, but one of the clues comes a little earlier in this chapter. Jesus is in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And one of these temptations, the devil says to Jesus, to you I will give their glory and all this authority. But Jesus rejects this and all the other temptations, leaves the wilderness and begins his ministry. But as he does that, I'm not getting the sense that Jesus is thinking, okay, it's all going to be temptation-free, clear, smooth sailing from now on. Quite the opposite. I'm sure Jesus is well aware that in rejecting the temptations, he is rejecting the easy options. In rejecting the glory, Jesus realises that instead he will receive vilification. He's expecting the rage. Coming back to his hometown and immediately met with admiration and amazement must have been like that temptation all over again. I mean, who doesn't want to go back home and be acknowledged by those people that you've known all your life, that you've grown up around. This is, at least in part, about Jesus evidencing that the beginning of his ministry, he will reject the glory in terms of what we as humans associate glory to be. At the beginning of his ministry, He will not be the Messiah that people are expecting him to be. At the beginning of this ministry, he will not succumb to the temptations of the obvious and the easy ways. But there's more to this encounter than just what it says about who Jesus is. As fun as it would be for me to launch off into a Christological expose of the nature of Jesus' messianic mission, I'm actually more confronted by what this could say about me and my response to who Jesus actually is and not who I want Jesus to be. So I have to ask, what's behind the rage? Can I learn anything? And is there anything in their response that I can actually see in myself? Before these same synagogue members reject Jesus, they accept and affirm what he has to say. After Jesus reads and interprets the prophecy and says that it's fulfilled in their hearing, They think, great, this is awesome. Tell me more. But between verses 22 and verses 28, everything changes. Before Jesus cites the two prophetic examples in the stories of Elijah and Elisha, Jesus shows his hand. He does not plan to offer any of the miraculous prophetic messianic power and blessings that he does elsewhere. And he's just about to do immediately after this, he goes off and heals five people in five different situations. But not in Nazareth. I've no doubt that if you were at that time in human history to look around Nazareth, you would have found plenty of poor, captive, blind and oppressed people that Jesus could have turned his attention towards. In using the examples of Elijah and Elisha, he brings to mind lepers and widows, 
I'm pretty confident there would have been some lepers and some widows in the community in Nazareth at that time as well. What's behind the rage? Is Jesus' refusal to act on his authority, to act on his power in his hometown there and then for their benefit. The issue isn't that they don't agree with what he reads from the the scroll in Isaiah 61. The issue isn't that they don't agree with his challenge to be part of the fulfilment in their hearing of these words. The issue is where that fulfilment will take place and who it will benefit. And it won't be there and then and for them. And it's at this point that I start to get confronted. Maybe you do too. I start to think of all those times that I've had a here and now and for me response or expectation to what I see or what I want Jesus to do. I asked some big questions last week, but I wonder if this next one is even bigger. How do we deal with a Jesus who seems to be there for others but doesn't seem to be there for us? How often have you wanted to hear a message as profound and challenging, as charismatic as the Sermon on the Mount would have been, and all you got was someone like me giving you a wishy-washy long interpretation? How often have you heard the miracle stories and asked yourself, why is that not happening to me and the people that I know and the people that I love? How often, when church doesn't feel as good as it used to be, when life isn't going as well as it could, or you're not feeling as happy as you think you should be, do you question whether God is still there with you? Whether you're in the right place around the right people, or doing the right thing? Or maybe you might even wonder, have you done the wrong thing? Where is Jesus when you are not getting that sense of here and now and for you? How do we deal with a Jesus who seems to be there for others but doesn't seem to be there for us? What do you do when you notice Jesus over in Capernaum, healing everyone in sight, but he's not there when you need him? When I was in my 20s, which was a long time ago now, um, the Christian band that I was in, I think I've still got at least one box of those CDs floating around in the garage, um, we were starting to get some invitations to go and play and lead services and perform in different churches. And some of those weren't even Anglican. I know it's scandalous, but yes, we did go to other denominations. At some of those churches, I'd hear testimonies of radical encounters that people had with God. Some of them seemed to be supernatural experiences. And I remember wondering to myself, How come God isn't working that way with me? And the more I thought, the more I spiralled, and I, I got stuck, particularly around the gifts of the Holy Spirit, specifically speaking in tongues. I found myself asking regularly, how come all these people have all these fantastical gifts and I don't? Was it because I wasn't really a proper Christian? I hadn't said the right prayer in the right way? Was it because God hadn't chosen me? 
I know our Bible study did at least a couple of studies, particularly on the Holy Spirit. And I prayed again and again for the gift of speaking in tongues. But nothing. I don't remember the exact moment it dawned on me, but I do remember it feeling like a definite epiphany. That moment when I realised that I had grown up in a loving family with parents who loved Jesus, who had taken me to church, not always when I wanted to go, but given me a foundation in the stories of the Bible, opportunities to use my gifts and talents in the life of the church, and demonstrated godly love within our family and within our church. They'd also given me an opportunity and freedom and encouragement, once I left home, to take myself off to church when and where I thought was best to go. And what I realised was, there and then in my 20s, I actually had a real, a personal, and an active relationship with Jesus. And it dawned on me, as a person in their 20s, in that time in human history, in the 1990s, my story was a pretty radical story that not many people had. I realised that God works in different ways so that different people can come to believe. For some they do experience that more supernatural, unexplainable experience. But for others, it's, Stuart, get out of bed, it's time for church. Week in, week out. And at some point, without me realising it, I become an active Christian. Perhaps there was a reason why that testimony that I'd heard about that guy who seemed to have a supernatural response and his addiction had been cured. Perhaps that was because he had an an addiction and then it was what God needed to do to be able to reach out towards one of these continuing poor, captive, blind and oppressed people that continue to be part of our world and our stories. I was able to see that their experience didn't mean that mine was second rate or any less. I began to see that I was equally part of God's big purpose and God's big plan. I was no less a beloved child of God. Ironically, some years later, when someone pointed out to me that I, um, the gift that I, I had been aware that I'd had for some years, even way back then, of what it was called singing in the spirit, which is when both or either in public or private worship, words of praise and adoration just spontaneously come to somebody's lips, and I, and I realised that I had that gift. This person said to me, well, Stuart, that's a version of speaking in tongues. Didn't you realise that? My response was interesting. It wasn't this overwhelming sense of relief. Oh, finally! It was, oh, okay, cool. And I reminded myself of that passage where Paul says that speaking in tongues is the least of all gifts, and not to make a big deal out of it. there's a really big difference between the gospel of Jesus being expanded and Jesus actually rejecting or taking the gospel away from others. Even though these people in Nazareth seem to reject Jesus and want to take him off a cliff, Jesus isn't rejecting them. 
he does use some statements that are interesting. Um, you won't find a uh, doctor cure yourself um, and a prophet's not welcome in their hometown in the, in the book of Proverbs. Uh, but um, they were obviously colloquialisms of that time and place. And one of the colloquialisms of our time and place, which I'm glad my daughter's not here because she'd be embarrassed when I said it, um, is check your privilege. If this group of people had the insight to check their privilege, what would they have realised? How many people could say that they watched the saviour of the world grow up? If they had the insight to check their privilege, would they have started to be able to piece together the bigger picture, those stories that they'd heard for years about his birth and how unusual it was? That time when he took himself off to the temple when his family was visiting Jerusalem. I wonder whether they would have realised the experience that they'd encountered. But instead, the people of Nazareth got outraged and wanted to cancel Jesus because they heard him say the gospel was for someone else. The gospel was for their neighbour. And it wasn't just for them. But if they had the insight to check their privilege they would have realised that it would have ultimately been good news for them too. Because if it's good news for their neighbour, then they would have realised that they're their neighbour's neighbour. And it would ultimately be good news for them, for every neighbour's neighbour, which includes those people in Nazareth. I don't want to be accused of being too woke this morning, but have you checked your privilege lately? What is it about your story that is actually pretty unique, that might actually be radical or supernatural even, that you might have actually pushed to the background because things haven't been going your way lately? They might have been something different to what you'd hoped you'd been doing right here and now. Or God isn't seemingly present in the way that God might have been in the past. How do we deal with a Jesus who seems to be there for others but doesn't seem to be there for us? Well, this is what I think. We celebrate the ones who were lost and are found, especially when it's not us. We pay attention and show compassion to the poor, the captive, the blind and the oppressed in our world in which we live. We seek out the neighbour who is in need of the good news of Jesus Christ and we have the insight to check our privilege and see that we have not been abandoned. We are not excluded. And we are not any less. We are equally loved. And even in the end, if you still can't see yourself in the story of God's powerful and active work through Jesus Christ, who came to bring good news for all, my encouragement to you is get ready because now is your opportunity to experience that epiphany for yourself, that epiphany of how big God actually is who not only embraces those who seem obvious, who not only embraces those who are unexpected, 
even embraces you. Loving God, I thank you for your word, even though it is sometimes hard to understand and provides challenges and challenges that we don't always want to hear. Confront us with who you are and who you call us to be. Help us to rejoice when we hear stories of you at work in other places, other people, other churches. But help us not to miss the way that you continue to be at work in and through us. In and through this church. In and through you. And in and through me. Amen. Can I invite you to stand as we continue to worship?